Hello there, my fellow downtrodden peasants, and welcome to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today I'm gonna deliver on the second episode I promised on the province of Sylvania. Last time I dedicated quite a lengthy video, by my standards anyway, to just the history of this unfortunate region. And today I wanted to present it to you from a more neutral standpoint, and narrate to you about its geography, towns and inhabitants. I'm your host, the vampire narrator for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? To the east, Sylvania is bordered by the World's Edge Mountains, but in the other directions, its borders are less well defined. The line between Sylvania and Stirland to the west has been redrawn multiple times, every time independence has been declared. It has ranged from the edge of the Haunted Hills to the abandoned village of Muriest, and it currently stops stretches from the ruins of Mordheim down to the edge of the Beilerhof Marsh. In the north, the river Stur provides a border with Ostermark. To the south, it stops at a barren region historically claimed by Averland, but currently held by Stirland. However, the haunted reputation of that place's stinking marshes and fallow hills results in both the other provinces ignoring the area. The southwestern corner of Sylvania edges onto Mootland, a narrow border that is patrolled by halfling field wardens. The jagged shadows of the mountains stretch over this land at night, and cold wind blows down from the peaks. It is a land of harsh winters which paint the ground blindingly white. To go out after dark in such a winter is almost certain death. But, ironically, even to go out in a Sylvanian summer night is little safer. Storms frequently come down off the mountains along with winds and snows. This makes the land damp with many bogs and lonely moors. The Dark Moor, the Grim Moor on the southern edge of the Grim Wood, the Beilerhof Marsh, Morfen, and the Twisted Helfen, which witnessed the fall of Manfred von Karstein. The original tribes of the Fennoni had disposed of their dead in these bogs for centuries, and many of the troops of the von Karstein armies came from this area as well. Although the unstable ground and threat of undead makes them very dangerous, the Sylvanians are forced to visit them as they are the only source of the peat which fertilizes their fields and fuels their fires over the winter. The area also being known for edible berries like the sweet cowberry. It is in Sylvania that the woods of the Southern Empire become dense forests, shadowy places, patrolled by packs of huge, perpetually hungry wolves. In the northwest is the Verhungern or Hunger Wood, where the canopy of the trees is so tangled that a permanent night is created underneath them, in which many strange fungi grow. In the northeast is the Grim Wood, which is supposedly haunted by an unseen monster, which takes only maidens who dare to tread there. To the south is Ghoul Wood, said to be ruled by some of the Strigoi who has thrown in his lot with the von Karsteins and lent them the aid of his flesh eaters. Bisecting the land is a string of chalk hills, which do make a good sheep herding country if nothing else. The Wharton Downs in the northeast stretches down to the haunted hills in the west. Even when it isn't chalk, most of the soil in Sylvania is thin and useless, and people here struggle to eke out a living out of it. The towns and cities which are scattered across Sylvania are even more isolated than other settlements in the Empire. Scavenging what little life provides them on this fertile land, the peasants live in small communities and interrelated families from which they never venture out for fear of what awaits them in the land surrounding them. There are very few stone roads, rather it is the rutted and half-flooded roads connecting most of the towns, and navigation is nigh on impossible, except in the relatively dry summer months. During the rest of the year, access to the towns is cut off except for the most desperate or foolhardy travelers with little knowledge of the outside world. The people of Sylvania do not care much for news anyway. The inhabitants are more concerned with daily survival, raising starving goats or pigs and tending to their farms in the hope of gathering enough harvest to survive another winter. The towns of Sylvania are in perpetual disrepair, as stone and wood are difficult to come by and many buildings have been patched up for centuries or even millennia. 
Mind you, they all have boarded up windows and heavy doors to keep them away from the predators at night. Primitive amulets and relics of a dozen different gods hang from every lintel and doorway. Villagers paint protective symbols on their gates and fences in pig's blood to keep them safe from the unnatural horrors of this ghastly realm. Ever since Vlad von Karstein closed down the temples, they too have fallen into disrepair, and very few priests venture into Sylvania without an escort of armed men. Furthermore, none of them actually stays longer than the days necessary to collect tithes or perform what rituals they can for the ungrateful peasants. In reality, Sylvania is a godless realm, claimed by the darkness centuries ago. Sylvanians have a very blasé attitude towards death and the dead, which is quite at odds with their neighbors. They take a perverse pride in the harshness of their life, seeing anyone else as soft for living in warmer climates, using black powder weapons, or associating with the other races. Sylvanians believe in the worst of stereotypes about the outside world, and it is common to find that they believe dwarves drown cats and halflings actually eat each other. The attitude goes all the way back to the tribes of old, who refused to deal with the dwarves they encountered in the foothills of the World's Edge Mountains because they believed they came from the same place as the marauding greenskins. Even the biggest towns of Sylvania are still considered rural backwaters by the standards of the other empire folk. Half-empty places, where everyone wears cod pieces out of fashion for five decades. Because the population of Sylvania never properly recovered from the Black Plague all those centuries ago, overcrowding is never a problem here. In addition to disease, mutation is rife among the peasants. The thin soil has been riddled with warpstone ever since 1111 IC, giving Sylvania one of the highest rates of mutation in the empire. The most deformed mutants are cast into the woods or sent to Drakenhof, but many who would be burned elsewhere in the empire are accepted in Sylvania. In a rather ironic twist of tolerance, hunchbacks, walleyes, and more, even those with additional fingers, are treated no differently from anyone else here. With the low yield of the crops, starvation is a permanent threat, and most will accept the hunger pains as a normal part of life. Turning to sweet pork, the Sylvanian euphemism for human flesh, is considered bad but not evil. Desperate times can call for desperate measures, and the ghouls raiding a village were often part of the same village just a year earlier. They harbor resentment towards the Empire, especially towards Stirland. They avoid all contact with the outside world, and many know very little about it. It is not uncommon for Sylvanians to not realize that they are even a part of the Empire, and many couldn't even name the Emperor. Those who do know a little about the lands beyond their own know that they will never be accepted there, and Empire folk have as low opinion of Sylvanians as Sylvanians do of the Empire folk. The life of the average Sylvanian peasant is brutal and short, and they see the vampires as merely another aspect of that. Sometimes the crops will fail. Sometimes the winter is particularly harsh. Sometimes greenskins or worse come to raid from the mountains. Sometimes the plague comes, and sometimes the vampires come. They do keep garlic and other herbs around their windows as a matter of course, yet they will willingly give up their children if they cannot afford to feed them or cannot afford to pay the blood tax. And they will turn over a foreigner in an instant even if they only stop to spend the night at an inn. The blood tax is in fact the only main tax paid by Sylvanians, a tradition dating back generations. The amount paid differs from place to place, depending on the vampire warlord controlling the land. In Nachthafen, for example, Countess Gabriella refuses to feed on the lowest of peasants and only taxes the relatively affluent townspeople who can afford more than one set of clothes. She chooses to leave them alive after feeding, most of the time anyway, to increase their loyalty to her. In Eshen, the tax demands the firstborn daughter of every family, who is then never seen again, leading to some parents attempting to disguise their girls as boys to avoid the payment. The smaller villages are typically only taxed once a year, although the amount can vary based purely on whim. Those who are foolish enough to hide from the Count's men when they come to collect are dealt with brutally, and the blood tax is then raised for that particular village. 
This can lead to situations where neighbors turn in their neighbors to avoid offending the masters. Despite their general dismay for the horrible circumstances of their lives and their cruelty of their undead masters, there have been Sylvanians both brave and lucky enough to escape into the Empire, into Stirland proper, and become refugees. As Sylvania is technically part of Stirland, Alberic Haupt Anderson, the Elector Count of Stirland, has shown a lot of concern for the well-being of the Sylvanians. Nevertheless, he has refrained from marching into Sylvania to liberate his would-be people, as he knows how costly a war with a vampire can be. So many centuries of religious persecution by the von Karsteins and more have changed the attitude of the Sylvanian people. Although it is rare to find any priests or temples here, the people have adapted, developing a widespread belief in superstition as a substitute for religion. Some of these are both interesting and quite bizarre, so I thought to include them in the episode as well. To quote, Spilling salt is bad luck, and the only remedy is to grab a handful of salt and run three times around the hearth without spilling a single grain. If you see a magpie perched on a wall, it means you will soon receive a message. Sweeping on a holiday brings bad luck. On Geheimnisnacht, Sylvanians light a candle for each member of the family who has died, then place all of them at the windows of the rooms in which they died. If they died outside the house, they are placed at a gatehouse. The most unfortunate villages are thus so lit up on Geheimnisnacht that it appears to be daytime. If you don't whistle when passing graves, you can inhale a ghost, which is both unhealthy and unlucky. It is good luck to cut your hair during a storm. If a Sylvanian sees a reflection in a pool, he must spit into it to ward off bad luck. Although there are barely any mirrors in Sylvania outside of the nobility, the same is done with them. This old custom has only contributed to worsening the image of Sylvanians as uneducated in the eyes of the rest of the Empire. The uniform colors of the former armies of Sylvania would carry over from the Von Drax and later the Von Karsteins. They are black, purple, and garnet red. When Vlad Von Karstein came to power, he would change the design of the banners to incorporate elements of his family's banner. And over a period of a century, he gradually changed or eliminated the previous symbols by incorporating his own. The first known change was the disappearance of the symbols of Sigmar. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the land of Sylvania and its inhabitants and customs for today. A very unfortunate region of the old world, to say the least. One can only wonder or imagine what this place would have been like if the undead menace had never actually settled here. Sure, it would have probably not been as bountiful as Averland, for example, but one can still be curious. Anyway, what are your final thoughts on this cursed but still very interesting province? Do share them in the comments below. And before you go there, Transylvania, which Sylvania is loosely inspired from, is not in fact a poor and backwater place like this. And we don't have vampires either. If you found this informative though, do consider leaving a like, share and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching, and the blessings of Sigmar be upon you.